Okay, hello and welcome everyone. Let's get started. So today we have uh, Professor Dr. Dilawar Anjum. He is uh, a professor in the Department of Physics at Khalifa University in Abu Dhabi, United Arab Emirates. And today he will be talking on transmission electron microscopes. So without any further delay, uh, Dr. Dilawar, floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Vasim. Thanks a lot. It's my great pleasure to uh, speak with you guys about a very important technique. Um, it's 9 p.m. in the UAE right now. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm speaking from home in case my background looks a little uh, casual, so I don't mean that. So uh, I hope I will give you a very serious message. <laughs> uh, so I'll be speaking, as Dr. Vasim said, about transmission electron microscopy and spectroscopy of materials. So let's get into it. So this is going to be the outline of my presentation. So I'll introduce uh, the technique uh, and then uh, I'll show its applications, uh, 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 both from imaging side, spectroscopy side, and even the mechanical properties. Uh, various properties can be visualized or determined using transmission electron microscope, but I will uh, show you only the mechanical properties uh, data. And then I'll conclude overall the presentation. So the background and rationale of the uh, of the instrument uh, is basically going to be given now. But before I go there, uh, I want to give you a little bit of background about myself. So I'm a PhD uh, uh, in physics from a university at Albany, New York. Uh, my field of research was nanofabrication of semiconductor devices. Then I worked as a cryo-electron microscopy scientist in Burnham Institute for Medical Research in San Diego, California. Uh, for a few years, I was there, and then I moved to Pittsburgh East Coast, uh, where I worked for the same job, but a different place uh, for a couple of years. And then I went to industry. So I spent about uh, uh, six years uh, working for Thermo Fisher and Gatton. Uh, on the applications of transmission electron microscope. Uh, and then uh, in 2009, I was uh, appointed by Thermo Fisher Scientific as a senior scientist to uh, work with the KAUST uh, uh, scientists on the transmission electron microscopy analysis. So for those who do not know about KAUST, KAUST is a world-class university in Saudi Arabia. It's, uh, it's 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 very active in research and uh, uh, and and getting very big recognitions. So currently, uh, I'm working in uh, Khalifa University, which is also an emerging university uh, of Middle East. My role here is, uh, of course, to teach physics, but my main research still revolves around performing. Uh, microscopy analysis of materials. So, in the past, I was always uh, applying transmission electron microscope from the last four years in uh, in Abu Dhabi. I'm, uh, I'm applying any form of microscopy, including even AFM, optical microscope, and scanning electron microscope as well. So, I am these days all about microscopy, in, unless only about, uh, you know, something else is done. So, then I change. But the more 99% my research is about all four types of microscopes. So I wanted to make a point about the importance of characterization in the material science and engineering field. So we as scientists work on this base of this tetrahedron. So uh, we can use chemistry, physics, or bio to process the materials to optimize their structure and their properties. So then we as engineers take this information to make a devices out of it. For, and then optimize the performance. And we can see in the middle of this tetrahedron is the characterization. So characterization is equidistant for all these four corners of the tetrahedron. So all the scientists or engineers benefit from the characterization. Characterization comes in two, uh, uh, two modes, imaging and spectroscopy. Uh, and this is what I'm gonna be talking about today with you guys. So when it comes to imaging or microscopy, so basically we as human uh, have a limited resolution or limited uh, capability of seeing the smallest objects. So we can seize objects up to 75 microns 
or or bigger very clearly but below that we have a problem so we we then use magnifying devices to enlarge the images so that our eyes can see them uh, more nicely so uh, the magnification required for an object is given by this formula so if we're looking for an object uh, which is 100 uh, let's say uh, 25 micron so this will tell you what kind of uh, magnification we need. So we put 25 micron here, we realize that we need a magnification of three times. So, and from magnifying to all the way, the, the devices have different capabilities of magnification. So I have a listed few. So up to the optical uh, transmission, sorry, electron microscope, we can magnify the objects as high as 2 million X. So this is so high magnification that we can see atoms. Here's an example of a transmission electron microscope image showing the atoms of graphene. So, so it, it's very clear that the magnification range depends on the types of the device or system we are using to magnify. So that is, um, is uh, uh, why, because there is a limited resolution of, the, uh, of these devices. So no matter we use uh, geometrical optics or Raleigh criterion, or we use wave optics, this uh, uh, resolution capability of a of a device is given by uh, by the wavelength used and the numerical aperture used uh, to uh, to basically uh, to image the uh, object. So these two formulas are very similar. So 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 the idea is very clear that that there is a minimum uh, capability that uh, that cannot be passed by a given system. So, for example, uh, if we are using optical microscope, we will be limited by the wavelength and the lens uh, of, uh, we are using. So, if we want to use something smaller, we need to change the device. And here is an example uh, taken from literature telling you the evolution of the resolution in microscopy. Here we are showing this as a function of, of, uh, of years. Uh, on the y-axis, you see resolving power or the, you can say, resolution. And then here is the minimum feature size. So starting from uh, 1800s with optical microscope, uh, we reach its limit um, uh, in the, in the mid-1900s that, uh, that the, the, uh, the resolution of the optical microscope, conventional microscope, can be only obtained up to the, up the half wavelength limit of the microscope. So if we are using a red light, for example, which is about 700 nanometer wavelength, so we can get the resolution about 350 nanometers. So, so to, uh, to, to overcome this barrier, uh, uh, then uh, we must you need to use the uh, devices. I, I, either they have very high, high um, uh, uh, numerical aperture or we use the wavelength. And this is exactly what was done by uh, uh, Ruska, Ernst Ruska and Andy Noll. So we see that they use electron microscopes. Uh, that one, because the electron wavelength of the electron microscope is thousands of times smaller than the wavelength of the light. And we can see that in, in even um, 1930s, they show the resolution was better than the optical microscope. And then uh, the, the further developments in this field allowed us to see uh, up to one angstrom uh, resolution in about 2000, uh, but then that also reached the limitation. Uh, so the uh, because the ultimate resolution in the transmission electron microscope was determined by the aberration, particularly spherical aberration. So uh, so in, in early 2000s, uh, the spherical aberration factors were developed and they opened up a new uh, new avenue to uh, to uh, to further improve the resolution of the of the instrument. So today we are at a place where we can easily say that we have a resolution of uh, about 0.4 angstrom uh, number, which is quite quite unprecedented. Overall, if you wanted to approximate, so the best microscopes the resolution today can be written as about 25 times the wavelength of the electrons at 300 kilo electron volts. So this is the typical promise that uh, that uh, that's made by the transmission electron microscope today. So this is where we are, and then I'm going to show you the examples how how this wonderful instrument is uh, is utilized in materials science and engineering. Uh, the spectroscopy is equally exciting and uh, and live field. 
So starting with Newton, he showed that the white light through the prism that consists of colors, this spectrum or rainbow pattern is basically already a spectroscopy pattern. Uh, so since then, uh, we as scientists did not look back. We continue uh, finding new ways of doing spectroscopy and improved ways. Uh, uh, these two uh, EDS and EELS, EDS stands for energy dispersive spectroscopy and EELS stands for energy loss, uh, electron energy loss spectroscopy are part of the transmission electron microscope. Yeah, so this field, as I said, is ever evolving. This year's Nobel Prize is also given to the people from spectroscopy field. So, so spectroscopy is equally exciting. So now let's go to the instrument. So a transmission electron microscope is a unique tool that gives you the capability of imaging and spectroscopy at one stop. So you can do both in one go. So this is the amazing capability of, uh, of an instrument because they have uh, different uh, uh, you know, uh, areas of strength. Sometimes imaging is uh, needed at the time, spectroscopy needed. So combining the two makes us uniquely capable of, uh, of observing material properties, uh, material structure, material morphology very nicely. So if I give you the introduction to this tool, it's shown here. So this is the cross section of the, of the TEM column. So what we see, we have major parts uh, starting with electron gun that provides the electron beam, either thin magnet source or field emission source. And then we have a few electromagnetic lenses. We call them uh, as an illumination module that allows us to give a very focused or very uh, uh, a parallel beam, depending upon the mode we like. And that specimen is loaded here. We label that area as an octagon. So this is basically where the objective lens is housing. And this makes the first image of the of the sample after the electron pass through pass through the specimen and then we have a bunch of more lenses uh, to either project the focal plane onto the screen or the or the uh, or the image plane onto the screen so we call that image or mega or diffraction pattern so there are a couple of spectroscopy tools that can be attached to this uh, this column one is the EDS as i said before so EDS column is attached here so that collects the X-rays generated by the electron beam passing through the specimen. But these electrons, which are, uh, are uh, giving energy to the uh, to the electrons in the specimen, uh, they uh, they can be uh, I mean energy lost electron can be also dispersed by using something called electron prism, and this prism separates the electrons based on the energy loss, and this technique is called EELS. So I'll be giving the introduction to all these three techniques today. So, as I said, so microscope can be divided into 4 major parts. We have electrons or, or electron beam. And then we have electromagnetic lenses that are used for focusing and we have objects. Uh, we call them specimens and then last part, but not least is the cameras. Uh, I just want to mention that the overall topic is quite complex and it will be very difficult for me to cover all these. Uh, topics nicely in, uh, in, in about 45 minutes time. So I'm going to skip. Detectors, uh, just let you know that detectors are just used to, uh, to collect the uh, signal so that our eyes can see the images. Uh, but I don't want to uh, uh, undermine or, uh, or, or under, uh, you know, uh, underrate the importance of detectors. They are very important. In fact, the major developments happening these days are due to electron detectors. But nevertheless, to make my point about the physics of a transmission electron microscope and first three uh, uh, parts of the of the microscope are good enough uh, at this stage. So, how to tackle the physics of uh, of the transmission electron microscope? Uh, vaguely speaking, we can divide into two theories. We call some first theory as a semi wave optical theory and the other one is full wave optical theory. Uh, in the semi optical wave theory, uh, what we are talking about, where we are treating the electron lenses as the distribution in space for the electric field or magnetic field. Okay. And electrons pass through these magnetic or electric fields as the as particles. But this uh, I labeled that in red color so that I make a difference that uh, these uh, these assumptions are done for the uh, electron microscope before the specimen. So if I take you back for a second, so we're talking about these electrons. 
okay so we treat them like this once the electrons pass through the specimen uh, we have to approximate specimen so we we approximate specimen as these uh, as the collection of electron scatters scatters okay the electrons pass through the specimen uh, uh, um, through uh, a specimen as as well as through the uh, uh, lenses which are below the specimen either as beams electron beam like uh, like uh, you can call them as like a cylinder of beam or as waves waves means uh, uh, the uh, waves that we say are coming from the schrodinger equation so in fact both of them are wave schrodinger equation so beam a is an approximation uh, it's this uh, this approximation is used when we are talking about bright field or dark field TEM images. If we are talking about high resolution TEM images, then we, to, then we must include electron as waves. So it's very clear that uh, electrons, once uh, they pass through specimen, either we treat them as beams or we treat them as waves. So specimen itself is the bunch of uh, electron scatterers. So uh, the both topics are the topic of, of, uh, of quantum mechanics. The other theory is quite complex, where the electron wave is treated as, a, 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 I mean, sorry, electrons are treated as waves and before the specimen, as added after the specimen. So there is no beam, there is no particle nature of the electrons, only wave nature of the electrons. And electron lenses are also treated as, as a electron um, a complex phase shifters or, or electron phase shifters. So, but this this theory is quite complex. So again, uh, I'm going to take this out of the uh, uh, today's presentation. So I will be showing you uh, the uh, the uh, information based on on semi-wave optical theory. So very quickly passing through uh, the electron lenses. So here is the electron lens. So on the right, first of all, we see the uh, 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 optical lens. So where we see that optical lens. Uh, collects the scattered light and puts it in the uh, focal plane and image plane. So that's how it works. And the and the ray passing through the optic axis keep going straight down. So where they meet, we call that uh, 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 I mean meet as focal point, and where they get dispersed, uh, same way in the image plane. Uh, sorry, object plane, we call it uh, image. We realize that image gets inverted. So in the case of uh, case of uh, electron lenses, we do not have glass. This is a glass, but here we don't have glass. We, as I said before, either have electric field or magnetic field. It happens to have that the magnetic field is a lot more uh, easier uh, to operate uh, as well as uh, very uh, high quality as well. So uh, today's microscopes overwhelmingly come with magnetic lenses. So, but the path of the electron is very clear. So it starts from here, this part of the object. It enters the magnetic field, and then it uh, it, uh, it it uh, it it makes a circular or helical path before it ends up in the object plane. But uh, you see that here, the image is not only inverted but also rotated. So that's how the uh, electron lenses work. So their job is very similar to the job of a glass lens for light. However, however, the image gets rotated as well by an angle of phi. So uh, let me give you very quickly the basically entry-level college physics. So the electron lens is used uh, in a transmission electron microscope, have the field here. I apologize, by the way, for having such a busy slide. But I hope you guys will follow me when I when I take you through. So this is the electric uh, magnetic field lines. So along the z-axis, uh, this is the optic axis, by the way. So along the z-axis, the magnetic field changes like a, like a Gaussian or, or curve. So uh, we see its maximum in the center and decreases on both sides. And a same way for the radial field. The R component of the magnetic field goes like this. So it starts with negative first, gets maximum at about one quarter of the of the region of the magnetic lens, and then uh, gets a zero in the center, and then reverses on the right side. So both are having mirror kind of symmetry, and the theta component of the magnetic field is zero. The electron initially enters like this, so it has a velocity that has only z component. 
So overall, what we are doing, as I just uh, uh, said before in the beginning, in the semi-wave uh, optical theory, we use electron as particle and magnetic field as the as this distribution of B fields in space. So what we are talking about then, this electron will experience a force due to this magnetic field. And then uh, this force is given by Lorentz force. And what we are basically doing, we're gonna be solving this uh, Lorentz force equation in four regions. We can divide this into four. So this is uh, one quarter of, uh, of BR. I mean, BR means a radial component of the magnetic field is region one. And then the other uh, b where you have BR negative and uh, you have uh, a BZ uh, part, this is region two. And then in the other side, those two reverses. So this region three is basically minus of region two and region four is the minus of, of region one. So we can go through them region by region. So here in the first region, as I said, electron has only velocity along the Z axis and magnetic field in the beginning has only R component. When you solve in region one, you realize the electron feels a force along the theta direction. So in a way it gets gains a velocity in the, in the theta direction. So it starts a revol uh, uh, going up and that's what it is shown here. Okay, uh, but then in the, in the second region, we have uh, two components of velocity because from first region, electron not only uh, have a VZ component, but also have a theta component. However, now in the second uh, region, uh, BR is decreasing and BZ is increasing. So we can assume BZ, BZ is dominant, so BR is nearly zero. So when we do that and we solve it, uh, we, we see that in the second region, electron uh, uh, experience a force along the R direction. So as it sees itself away from the from the optic axis or going away from R. So in second region, it starts, starts coming towards the optic axis. And then uh, due to the inertia, it continues. But then uh, the, as it goes along the Z axis, uh, the region three uh, reverses its, uh, its course and sends it back towards the optic axis. So this is how the electron started from the optic axis uh, in the object plane ends up in the optic axis point in the image plane. So as I said, the idea is to focus the electrons very similar to glass lens, although the electron makes a helical path. So as I said, so uh, I already mentioned uh, in, in region third and four, the electron basically just reverses. Now let's quickly look into the uh, interaction of the beam electrons with the specimen. So variety of things happen. Uh, here I have listed uh, uh, listed all of them, but uh, for the sake of uh, time, we'll be only covering three. So what we are seeing here, the electron pass through the specimen and most of the electrons go without any problem. We even don't, uh, I mean, they even don't feel any 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 uh, any any forces from the atoms of the specimen so we call that kind of electrons as direct electron or direct beam but some uh, some of the electrons scatter if they scatter without losing any energy we label them as elastically scattered electron if they lose energy we call them as inelastically scattered electrons both elastically and scattered electrons form the theory of tam stem or F tam or E's respectively. And the, this inelastic part is very interesting. So when the electrons of the beam were losing energy to the electrons in the, in the material, so they were basically exciting the atom electrons. And when they, uh, when they, uh, when they de-excite, they give us an X-ray photon, we call them characteristic X-rays. And this is the basis of the energy dispersive spectroscopy. Uh, one more thing you have to keep in mind in the transmission electron microscope, the specimen has to be thin enough so that the electron beam can pass through. Most of it is either direct beam or elastic beam so that we can form a good quality image. Otherwise, the image is going to be fuzzy. So, uh, so uh, talking, I'm quickly going to go through the uh, physics of the electron scattering from the specimens. Well, as I already said that the specimen is a collection of electron scatterers. 
So atom is one electron scatters. So we have to start with one atom and then sum over all atoms to find out total scattering amplitude. So, uh, but from the one atom, this is called form factor, F K naught K. Uh, this is coming from the Schrodinger equation and its mod square is represented as probability of scattering into uh, solid angle omega, D omega, sorry, uh, or we call it scattering cross action. That's all I want to say. I don't want to say more than that because this is very complex top. So now uh, putting the restrictions on this scattering, we can come up different scenarios. So first scenario is when the electron uh, wave vector, uh, incoming electron wave vectors equal to, I mean, uh, the scattered wave vector in magnitude, but not in direction, we call it elastic scattering. Otherwise, if its magnitude is also not equal, we call it inelastic scattering. And without giving you details how this is solved, and here is the formula for the case of the uh, 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 elastically scattered electrons. It's clear that the it depends on atomic number square and the change in the uh, uh, change in the basically uh, direction of the electrons. So the, that delta k is the basically magnitude of the of the direction change. So uh, now if you have a material which is a crystalline and then you sum all these kind of single scattering over the lattice of the, of the material, you have two extra kind of uh, amplitude factors. One of them is called structure factor, other one is called shape factor. Both of them are very important. They make the basis of the electron crystallography. So, and here uh, I'm just giving you their names without telling you much about the details, but uh, they are used in the bright field, dark field imaging as well as STEM imaging. So, in the case of inelastic part, before we go to inelastic of the uh, inelastic scattering of the electrons, I mean, so it's important for us to understand uh, what uh, material uh, shows up uh, for the beam electrons uh, when the inelastic scattering takes place. So, for inelastic scattering, number one, it takes place, place uh, with the atom electrons. It's not with the nuclei, unlike in the elastic case. In the case of elastic, the electrons were scattering from the nuclei of the atoms. So, inelastically, they scatter from the electrons of the atoms. So, electrons of the atoms live like the band structure of the material, and band structure has two parts, the valence bond and conduction band, as well as the uh, core part. So these two has to be looked at separately. And in the first part where we are talking about the valence excitations to conduction excitations, we call that uh, valence electron energy loss. Uh, so here is the probability, or you can say differential cross section. And we can notice that this probability not only depends on solid angle, but also on energy loss. And this is the energy loss formula. It's basically the, the dielectric formulation that we sometimes see in the optical case as well. So, and when we do the, uh, and when we do the experiment, we, I mean, disperse these energy loss electrons, we see that this is how they are, uh, they are uh, looking. So, the uh, energy loss electrons are, are uh, uh, I mean, the coming from valence, if you're looking at the loss from 0 to 50 electron volts, and beyond that, we start seeing the uh, core loss, uh, core loss uh, energy losses. Uh, uh, we uh, 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 we will look at them um, on the next slide. But the probability of uh, of scattering of this uh, is given here, as I said. So this brings a lot of information to us uh, to to name a few. For example, thickness of the specimen can be determined, and the properties of the materials can be determined by looking at this probability. Okay. And then uh, if I go to the next one, core loss, core loss is given by generalized oscillator strength or, or, or Fermi Thomas uh, electron atom model. So here we see that the, the uh, atom electron go from uh, alpha state to beta state through the interaction of the, uh, of the electron, beam electrons. So, and, and, the, and the probability is given by this formula. It's quite complex, but nevertheless, the, the probabilities uh, show up in the energy loss spectroscopy as like this. Here is an example of two different, uh, two, two different atoms. 
so this is, for example, titanium atom, the way it seems, and that looks like coming from the oxygen atom. So we have we call these uh, these uh, these probabilities as energy loss edges. So this is uh, coming from, as I said, most likely titanium, and that comes from oxygen. They bring a lot of information as well, like elemental composition and uh, environment of the elements as well as oxidation states. The uh, emission, uh, I mean, optical emission takes place uh, uh, like this way. So energy loss happened at uh, energy level one, and then electron is excited to energy level two. And we and at this uh, this process, the uh, when the atom de excites, so it gives us an X-ray. So we can see that uh, in, in the uh, an, an uh, X-ray emission takes place at energy level two, while the energy loss takes place at energy level one. So there will be an inherent uh, uh, difference in the onset of the, uh, of the, of the peaks of, in the EDS as, as well as in the eels. Uh, but nevertheless, the overall uh, yield, fluorescence yield, I'm talking about the amount of X-rays generated by the atoms is given by this, form, this curve. So we clearly see that it depends on atom number. So uh, up to about uh, atom number 50 or 60, close to that, the, um, <clears throat> the, uh, uh, the X-ray emission plateaus. But we clearly see also that below the atomic number 20, the X-ray emission is quite low compared to others. So overall, it can be approximated by this formula. So now we are at a state where we can build our kind of like uh, uh, electron microscope is similar to optical microscope. So we have an object, so which is uh, basically scatters of electron waves or electron particles, and then the magnetic lens is as a magnetic field distribution in space, or it's a phase shifter. And then uh, uh, this lens have two planes, like any lens from the glass, uh, I mean, or optical case. So you have diffraction patterns and the image plane. And now I'm going to show you examples how the things look like in these planes. So if you look at the diffraction plane, you have uh, uh, different patterns depending upon type of the material. So if you have a nanocrystallines, you see fuzzy rings. You have a single crystal, you see very uh, well dispersed or uh, dis I mean, periodic spots. And if you have a polycrystal, you see sharp rings. And if you happen to focus the beam on a single crystal sample, our uh, these dots become disks. This this uh, topic is called convergent beam electron diffraction and brings a lot of information uh, to electron crystallographers. In the image plane, depending upon the magnification and depending upon the type of the specimen, we can have a type of contrast. So the easiest contrast is called mass thickness contrast, where thick regions or the or the uh, high density regions scatter more electrons than the other case. So, but objective aperture uh, used below the objective lens uh, uh, blocks the more scattered beam. So, as a result, the high density or higher atomic number regions in the specimen look dark, and the other one look bright. Here is an example. We see these uh, uh, crystals of. Uh, of manganese oxide sitting on on on, on holy carbon. So car holes are the brightest. Carbon is uh, is uh, is uh, darker than hole, and then the specimen is the is the darkest. So this kind of contrast is called called uh, mass thickness contrast. So if we have a crystal sample, particularly single crystal, so we can make uh, a selection, either the direct beam or the or the diffracted beam. So depending upon the beam we choose, uh, we, we label that, uh, that image as a bright field or dark field. So here is an example. So if we pick the direct beam, so we call that image bright field because background is white and the object is, uh, is dark. This thickness uh, fringes are very important. Um, they, are, uh, they are a big subject. They basically allow us uh, uh, to measure the thickness of the specimen along the Z direction. Uh, and and uh, and they also tell us the types of the scattering, how long the scattering takes place. So and then if we pick one of the diffracted beams, so we make the dark field image. In this case, the background is dark and specimen is bright. But if we if we collect most of the diffracted beams along with the uh, direct beam, so basically we are allowing them to interfere. Uh, and these are the case when we call something a phase contrast. 
So basically, the interference of these beams uh, is uh, is called phase contrast or high resolution image. Here is an example of a gold nanoparticle sitting on carbon. We clearly see the gold atom distributions in the particle is uh, is is uh, changing orientation as we go from one end to the other end. Uh, so, there is another mode in, in modern transmission electron microscope. We call it scanning transmission electron microscope. In this case, we focus the beam onto the specimen very sharply so, so that the beam diameter is about two angstrom or less. And then we scan the beam uh, using the raster scanning. And when we scan the beam and the, and the electrons transmitted, and then we can collect the collect the uh, scattered electrons and we let the uh, uh, directly uh, passing electron through the electron prism uh, to make the yields pattern uh, or spectrum. And then we use this black uh, region of the detector to make the image. So this kind of imaging is called high angular dark field imaging if the angle is quite large. And this is very important in terms of high resolution imaging. If the microscope is uh, well aligned or having spherical ablation correctors, we can have very high quality images here, for example, any example of a silicon in 110 direction. And we see that the dumbbells of, uh, of silicon can be observed easily in this way. And the intensity of these bright darts depend like this way. So it's, uh, it's very similar to the uh, Rutherford scattering. But not the same, but one thing is clear. The Z square factor is very important. So the last but not least is the energy loss. So if we keep letting the direct electron passing through the prism, so we will see there it has to have in inelastically scattered electron because inelastically scattered electron don't go too far in direction from the direct electrons direction. So we see that uh, uh, this uh, electron prism will disperse them just like uh, light prism makes a rainbow, electron prism also makes a rainbow of the electrons, but on top, it also focuses them so the, any red electrons going in any direction will end up in the same spot in the in the focal plane or yields plane and and by choosing the type of the electrons we can make a for a specific type of energy loss image so here is an example uh, of uh, of four elements uh, titanium iron and carbon so we can make these uh, these uh, maps and we can make a false RGB to show these distributions. Very, very powerful way of making elemental maps in transmission electron microscope. So let me show you some examples now in the last few minutes. So the examples are a very simple example. So when you, basically this is the starting example. You have a nanoparticle sample. You just go ahead, put them on a, on a copper grade, where copper grade having a carbon, holy carbon is better. So, and then uh, our nanoparticles will be looking like this at a low magnification. A low magnification image is already very powerful. We can see the, their faceting, their shape, I mean, very well. And we can see uh, overall the, as I said, orientation perhaps as well, if we pay a little more attention. But, but if we don't want to pay attention from the image, we can go ahead and collect a diffraction pattern. And diffraction pattern is called selected area electron diffraction. This gives you the orientation very well. So all these rings basically telling you the, uh, the, these particles are oriented differently. Uh, if we continue increasing the magnification, here is an example of a silicon lattice having of silicon oxide on top. So we're looking at it from the cross-section view. So we see that uh, high resolution allows us to see the atoms distributed in silicon and also atoms in silicon oxide, but silicon oxide is amorphous, so atom pattern is not very clear. But in the case of silicon, because it's a single crystal, the atoms pattern look very clear. If, if we pay attention, we see some uh, defect lines, and, and we call them uh, dislocation lines or, uh, or some other defects depending upon their nature. In this case, they are the def uh, dislocation lines, but uh, uh, de depending upon uh, processing method, you can have stacking faults, you can have point fact defects and many other types of defects. So the defect analysis of materials can be done very nicely if we apply high resolution time analysis. 
Uh, you can apply the uh, HR temp to nanoparticle imaging. Here is an example of two nano two types of nanoparticles. Here is a gold nanoparticle uh, showing uh, the uh, obtained by aberration corrected temp microscope, and the atoms uh, pattern is very clear. Fasting can be seen. Everything is looks very nice. And same can be looked at as well in a different type of sample that has platinum iron biometallic. Uh, case so we can see not only the nice atom pattern but also the orientation that I was talking about in this image. So it's not clear orientation here, but it's very clear over here. This uh, th these two are same nanoparticles, it's just oriented differently. Uh, stem uh, here is an example of a bright field stem. You can also do that uh, by collecting the electrons passing near the optic axis. Uh, this is applied to an aluminum alloy. So aluminum alloy has some copper lithium in it and has also some other elements. So we see these precipitates made in aluminum alloy by these uh, these elements. Uh, this is dark field. Bright field is the opposite of this image. Looks very informative. They have lots of precipitate types and uh, and their morphology can be can be determined. Uh, stem, uh, in particular, in ab aberration correction mode, also allows seeing the nanoparticles very nicely, even smaller nanoparticles than uh, than the high resolution TEM. So here is an example of a very small size nanoparticle of gold showing very nice pattern uh, with heart of stem. Uh, as I said, so if the beam diameter is helping, we can not only see nanoparticles. We can we can start seeing nano clusters to single atoms. Here is an example of that. So here is the iridium at ten nano clusters, uh, and then here is an example of a platinum single atoms loaded onto titanium dioxide crystal. So some examples now of spectroscopy. So this is a very simple example of uh, spectroscopy where we basically focus our beam onto a region and perform EDS analysis. We, and we know these characters X-ray peaks positions, and we know the elements. If we do a little bit better job, we know that this region looks very different than this region. So we can focus the beam here and here and get two different spectra of EDS. And we figure out that uh, basically uh, 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 this area where you see uh, this uh, bubbly region is basically potassium hydroxide. And then the other region is the, is the uh, 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 potassium phosphate, sorry. And then here we see that uh, it's, it's cobalt oxide. So, uh, and then uh, uh, now I'm going to show you how spectroscopy is applied in the metal, uh, in the metal uh, field. So here is an image of, uh, again, again, same aluminum alloy uh, taken in dark field uh, stem mode. So what we see, uh, again, uh, basically the uh, region uh, having uh, uh, grain boundaries and the precipitates both in grains and at the grain boundaries. Very nice image showing lots of detail, but we are not sure about the composition. So this is uh, solved by taking the uh, EDS uh, at each pixel. Uh, uh, this is aluminum alloy uh, AA2195. Uh, so very important alloy uh, in, uh, in, uh, in uh, industry used by aerospace people. So we clearly see that uh, that uh, the uh, the uh, long needle-like precipitates are of uh, copper, and the uh, purple color uh, uh, spherical, spherical precipitates are having some zirconium, and the uh, very bright dots or particles are uh, are of uh, 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 silver. So this there is another example. Uh, here we see that you have a nanomaterial of uh, copper, aluminum, zinc, and oxygen. Uh, hard of stem image looks like less informative this time, so we don't know much. We just see a bunch of uh, nanoparticles collected uh, together. We really don't know where is copper, where is aluminum, and so on. So the EDS mapping will help a lot. So here we have, uh, um, again, made uh, uh, four elemental maps, but I am presenting to you here on the right side, aluminum, aluminum and copper map composite. And we clearly see that the copper mix nanoparticles and aluminum is dispersed uh, uniformly inside. So basically, it's as if like actually the cup aluminum is like a host and copper is precipitate, which are in fact dispersed, not the other way around. 
and then uh, uh, we can also see the composite of, of copper with zinc uh, shows very similar like aluminum. So aluminum dis uh, dispersion or uh, you can say distribution and zinc distribution are very similar. Uh, but then we are not sure if copper, aluminum or uh, zinc, all of them oxidize or some of them are oxidized. Here is the map of, uh, or you can say composite of copper with oxygen. And we clearly see the, uh, I'm sorry for showing the oxygen in yellow color, so it may not be very clear, but you have to believe me, the yellow uh, distribution, or you can say oxygen distribution are pretty much at the same place where zinc and aluminum is, and it's not, it's not coming up at the place where copper is. So it's clear that copper is reduced, aluminum and zinc are present as oxides. So this stem EDS mapping can be extended to the highest limit. So this is the Im image, hard, hard of image of uh, strontium titanate, and we can do the uh, strontium mapping, titanium mapping, and oxygen mapping, and then show you the composite uh, to show the atomic resolution, like what are these atoms. So here is the example. So uh, we can clearly see the titanium atoms in uh, in red and green atoms in the uh, in uh, in uh, as strontium. So basically, bigger atoms pattern is strontium, and then the smaller atom pattern is the titanium. Uh, but but EDS uh, not always working. Sometimes it fails, particularly in the high entropy oxides kind of nanomaterials, uh, which are very complex, lots of elements. And when we do the EDS, lots of peaks overlap. So it's very difficult to separate the peaks from each other. It's very difficult to identify with 100% certainty that we have the elements we are looking for. On the other hand, E's have a very high energy resolution and, and, uh, and a decent field of view. Here you see that it's about 2000 electron volts. And so example of here is the lanthanum, samarium, cerium, and praseodymium and gadolinium. And they get uh, as nicely dispersed. I mean, their edges get nicely dispersed in the eels uh, spectrum. And based on this, we can make a very, very good map. So these maps are not only reliable, but they can also have some information. For example, their uniform kind of map is showing that this, in, in fact, high entropy oxide is a very good high entropy oxide. It's a single phase high entropy oxide. All the elements are present everywhere. And that's pretty much the goal of these people when they are making these uh, kind of oxides for catalyst uh, applications. Uh, we can also apply energy filter TAM. Uh, th in this example, it's applied to a solar cell material where uh, basically material is organic. Uh, we're looking for carbon-based signatures of, of, uh, of a donor uh, material, donor polymer material, and sulfur-based uh, material, which is acceptor, or other way around, it really doesn't matter. But uh, what matters is the is this is the is the carbon and uh, and sulfur signatures. So we can follow them and then make the maps. And here we clearly identify them. So wherever sulfur is, that's basically that the acceptor part. And then wherever is the red or carbon is, that's the donor. So we can clearly see that. Uh, uh, these red and uh, and and uh, green distributions are very informative in terms of when the charge carriers are created. So before they get absorbed uh, or they get dissipated into the material, uh, the green region must collect them, and the and the connectivity of the green region will ensure that they get uh, transferred to the. Uh, to the electrodes. So that's how we can identify. Uh, you can actually talk about the talk about the efficiency of the solar cell that you are making from this material. So, so last example now is about the properties. I'm I promise you I will show you the mechanical properties. So here is an example of that. So we have aluminum alloy. This is 2024 alloy. It's a different alloy. It's also used uh, uh, in sometimes aerospace, but mostly in the in the corrosion industry. So uh, this uh, this alloy is uh, uh, having a precipitate like this way. Uh, so this is a dark field stem image. Here we are applying two different techniques. 4D stem means that at every pixel we are taking a diffraction pattern along with the dark field image, as well as we are collecting an eels pattern. Eels pattern. So this is the sequential uh, exercise. So you must collect the diffraction pattern first, and then once you complete all the diffraction pattern acquisitions at each pixel of the specimen, you then go back and do the experiment again to collect the uh, yields pattern with the same step size. 
so that uh, correlation can be done between the diffraction pattern and the plasma, or you can say energy loss pattern. So here, the uh, by collecting this, um, uh, we can base. I'm sorry, I did not mention, but uh, I should have given you a formula. But I was trying to tell you this: uh, the uh, the um, the distribution of these diffracted beams and their spatial uh, uh, changes uh, when we go from one pixel to the other is uh, is uh, represented as uh, strain, uh, and then the the position of the first plasma is the uh, indicator of uh, plus of the Young's modulus. So uh, by manipulating or ex or, um, or processing this Young's mod uh, sorry uh, the plasma peak position. We can calculate the Young's modulus at each pixel, just like we can calculate the strain by using diffraction pattern at each pixel. So we we continue doing that, and then we can make uh, 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 the uh, strain map as well as Young's modulus map. And here is the range of the strain as well as the range of the Young's modulus. So multiplying the two together will give us a residual stress map, and this is very informative. It will tell you. The plastic regions, elastic regions, compressively plastic, compressively elastic. So all these combinations can be determined by looking at the range of the stress. So that's how the mechanical properties of uh, of metals can be visualized by using a modern transmission electron microscope. Uh, with that, no, sorry, this is excess slide. I took that out. This data. Uh, I'm just gonna go ahead to the conclusions. So electromicroscopy and spectroscopy is a critical technique. So you cannot now separate the two. This is the message. Okay. It, in the past, they were separate, but not anymore. So we today label them as one technique. So it's a critical technique to unravel the science and engineering principles of material science at nanoscale. It enables not only imaging the structure and morphology, but also visualizing their composition and properties. It also has uh, also particular applications in the field of soft matter. I did not uh, 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 dwell on this one too much, but uh, you have to blame me. So uh, uh, this, for the interest of time, I took that slides out. So, but uh, you gotta believe me that transmission electron microscope is also making a big, big impact in the field of soft matter, bioscience, and many other polymer-like areas as well. So with that, I stop and uh, I thank you, my collaborators. And I, I took some, some schematics from internet. So I, I thank you for those guys who ever put these schematics on the web. But the data is mine. So now I'm open to the questions. I will uh, I will uh, skip okay, um, the uh, 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 display mode. So I can even probably open my video so I can see you guys if you speak from there. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much, Dr. Anjum, for the for the very well discussion uh, on the basics of electron transmission, electron microscope. So, with that being said, now the floor is open for questions. So, if you let's go to the chat box. So, if you have any questions, either you can you can type them here, or you can raise your hand, and then we can go from there. So, I'm going to quickly go through the message. Uh, so Abdul Ghani is asking which alloy is this? So I'm not sure which. Probably he was looking. Yeah, for I answered that. It is aluminum. Okay. Uh, aluminum uh, twenty one ninety five. I can. I, I actually did mention uh, maybe here. It's 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 been three four years. Uh, I I forget its name. Um, here twenty one ninety five AA. Okay. Perfect. This awesome. is the aluminum alloy, and then the second aluminum alloy where I showed the mechanical properties. Uh, that one was 2024. So both are uh, basically aluminum copper alloys having some other elements. And now 2195 has uh, lithium, and this one has, uh, has some uh, manganese, uh, magnesium, and uh, some silicon as well. Okay, the next question is from also from the chat uh, from Christopher Prince. Um, Dr. Anjum, do you want to go to that question? Yes, which software uh, have you used for time finding out that? I, I hope he's asking or she's asking about the, uh, the, uh, the peak position of the plasmas. That's a good question. Uh, I have published a paper, Dr. Jim Howe uh, from UVA, University of Virginia. He's actually a pioneer who introduced uh, 
plasma spectroscopy for measuring the Young's modulus in TEM. Uh, he used in TEM mode, but I, I, I extended this technique to use in STEM mode, uh, where uh, uh, now this development allows us to map Young's modulus. In, in Dr. Jim Howe's paper, you will see that it is only allowing you to have a number. So you will know a number, uh, for example, uh, here. So you will get a number from a given area. So it will be averaged out number for you. Uh, but in my, uh, these images, you see the Young's modulus values at each pixel. So, and this can be done easily by using digital micrograph, any latest version of digital micrograph uh, from Gatan website will allow you to, uh, to, uh, uh, to manipulate or process this data. So you can use nonlinear uh, least square methods uh, to, to find out, uh, you fit this peak to Gaussian and you don't care much about the amplitude or the full width at, at half maximum. Just look at the center position. Uh, by the way, you need to have a very high dispersion when you are acquiring the data. So in my typical data sets, we are uh, determining the uh, 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 this peak position at about dispersion of 30 milli electron volts. Uh, 50 to 60 milli electron volts will work, but you are uh, if you are going beyond 100 milli electron volts dispersion of each, uh, I mean, uh, then you are basically going into the place where you're losing the sensitivity because um, uh, sometimes the regions may not be very different from each other. So, so they may appear the same value of the Young's modulus. So 30 milli electron volt dispersion value is very good when it comes to sensitivity. And if somebody's saying that the, uh, the aluminum uh, alloy, or uh, I'm not sure the question was, the software is very expensive. No, this is freely available these days. You can go and download from Gatan website. Uh, there is other question about the alloy. I'm sorry, I'm, trying, I'm I'm gonna try to make it big so I can see the questions well. Sure, sure, yeah. Okay. So uh, just uh, for a clarification, what's the accuracy level of the mechanical properties? Yes, so very good question. I already talked about the accuracy of Young's modulus depends on the energy dispersion value of the energy loss spectrometer when you're acquiring the data. Uh, a value of 30 milli electron volt is very good. As I already said, you can check, you can compare that uh, uh, for aluminum alloy, uh, this accuracy falls into few um, just a mega uh, mega Pascal, so which is very good because uh, 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 the Young's modulus of uh, of aluminum is in giga Pascal. So when it comes to strain, same story. You are talking about the camera length, uh, so camera length uh, determines the uh, uh, determines the uh, diffraction pattern. So larger the camera length, better the accuracy is. Uh, so again. Um, uh, we are talking about in terms of uh, when we look at the single pixel uh, compared to the strain, uh, you are comparing the strain like a to total elastic limit of the alloy. So you got to keep the uh, pixel size about 20 times the size uh, smaller than the, than the total elastic limit. Okay, about 20 times. Uh, the uh, pixel size should represent a strain value. I mean, one one pixel size in your diffraction pattern. So that one has to be about 20 times or, or close less than the uh, total elastic limit, so that uh, the, you have enough sensitivity uh, in between. I think there are a few more questions uh, in the chat box. Okay, get propulsion polishing for yes, absolutely. Uh, this is very good. Uh, uh, yes, uh, the jet polisher way is the best way to prepare specimens. Um, they, are, they are not only easy, but also very accurate and gives you a large area to, to prepare specimens. That's correct. And what was the fluorescence yield formula? I can take you back. Um, this is, uh, you can easily find this formula, if I remember, from the uh, Nestor Zaluzak's papers on energy dispersive spectroscopy in transmission electron microscope. Um, he's from Oregon National Lab. Uh, you can search his articles and you will find, I believe uh, he has given these formulas in his paper. Or you can read from the book uh, on SCM by Goldstein 
and perhaps also uh, this I believe this can be seen in uh, in physics oriented book like Ludwig Reimer's book uh, on TEM uh, probably also on SEM. Uh, so the, the, this formula is fairly common in uh, electron microscopy textbooks. Uh, okay. Which software I, I have you used for finding out residual stress map? This is very easy. I don't need to, uh, but I particularly did that in uh, in uh, again in in a digital micrograph or or data and microscopy suit. So basically, once I have, uh, I I must say the um, uh, the residual strain map was made uh, or you can say generated uh, also in digital micrograph by using their version something called uh, STEMX. So STEMX allows you to basically follow uh, these uh, diffraction peaks, uh, but there is a better method, to be honest. Uh, the better method is Pi 4D STEM from University, uh, uh, I mean, Berkeley University. So Dr. Colin Office uh, group is uh, spearheading that, uh, that effort, as well as people from uh, Cornell, uh, also from uh, uh, from Urbana Champagne, Jim Zewer's lab, these three places you can you can see big effort is made on 4D STEM. Uh, they are applying the Python based techniques, but uh, I am a bit behind when it comes to applying Pythons uh, based. Uh, but uh, I bought a commercial product from Gaton, uh, which is not uh, better to be honest with you guys. But however, it's very easy, intuitive. You can just uh, follow the GUI and then click on buttons and give you data. So uh, for that reason, I, I apply this in Gaton to find a strain map like this. This gives you strain map along axis, x axis and y axis. So and uh, you, you need to keep in mind plasmons are along the z axis. So in a way, so we are combining three dimensions. So x and y has strain and the z direction collapsed and this is where we are measuring the Young's modulus. So, <clears throat> so this is, uh, we, we multiply the two again in digital micrograph very easily to get this residual strain, uh, uh, stress map. And other questions? Um, okay, if you feel that if your answer has not, if your question has not been yeah, answered. Yeah, I think, uh, I, I, uh, how is the I plasma used? One. I think this is a question from Arkeb. I, I, I think pretty much nicely addressed that part. So basically we follow the plasma and peak and we follow its center position in digital micrograph and that map allows us, you can see the Jim House paper. Jim House paper gives you a most general formula for the Young's modulus as a function of plasma and energy, uh, but you have to convert it to your metal, in this case, aluminum metal, so for us, this time, I think he gave an example as well, Dr. Jim Howe. So it's about uh, uh, 0 0.08 E uh, uh, plasma type power 2.5, something like that. So you can see that paper, you will find out. And what we are doing, calculating that at each pixel and then making a map out of it. Okay, if somebody wants to uh, ask a question, you can unmute yourself if you don't want to. Uh... Put it in the chat box. Sorry, I had my hand raised, but I had also sure, texted. Sure, yeah, you can go ahead and ask your question, please. Oh, I was um, I I texted it into the chat box. We're good. Okay. Oh, you texted. You. I'm sorry. Maybe I missed. What was no, your you question? No, I think you already answered her question. I think oh, there was okay. a question, okay. From, okay. Okay. Uh, there was a question at 12.53 from Christopher Prince. I'm not sure if you answered that one. Chris, did he answer your question? Uh, I'm sorry, I see time as nine. So maybe oh, I'm nine. I'm so sorry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no problem. Yeah. Early in the presentation, you mentioned since the electrons follow the helical path passing through the electron lenses, images both inverted and rotated by some angle phi. Are, are there any cases where uh, we would be interested in determining the magnitude of that angle? The answer is yes. Uh, actually, this is very interesting. Uh, it can allow you to not only know the strength of the of the magnetic lens, but also this is used uh, these days to determine the magnetic fields in the in the um, in the in the samples. So th this is very important. Uh, 
I mean, uh, yes, the answer is a big yes. I I have the formula, but I have to look into my dig into my uh, uh, my uh, uh, slides. But uh, if you look again, any textbook on a transmission electron microscope, you will find this rotation angle easily as a function of magnetic field. Okay, I think it's already after one, so we'll take one more question if there is any. In class students, any questions? Okay, not. Um, okay, it seems like there's no more questions. Uh, I hope I see. Okay, I think we are Mr. all. Okay. Sorry? No, I think. You, Christopher you said, I don't believe so. I think oh. uh, he meant I didn't answer his question. No, 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 no. no. So no, now I did. I was asking Thank him you. Thank if, you. if you have already, if his question was already answered. Okay, okay. And then gotcha. he's answering me. But then you already answered his question. So thank you. So okay, much. okay, gotcha. Um, okay, okay, Professor Anjum, thank you so much. Let's give a round of applause uh, for Dr. Anjum. Thank you. So once again, thank you so much and uh, hope to see you soon in another conference. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. It's my great pleasure to be able to speak with you guys. Thank you very much. Thank you. With that being said, we'll see you guys next week. Um, Karamani is going to be the one who's going to be presenting thank next you. week. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. I see so many people. Thank you. Thank you very much. Nawaz, thank you. All right. Bye now. Bye.